the second lesson in our series about support is based in 1 Corinthians 9, which starts with, am I not free? So I'll follow in the tradition of naming things after the first line. <laughs> but there's quite a bit of things to unpack here, so we'll just go uh, as far as we can get in a reasonable amount of time and then keep going to the next opportunity. But today we'll start at the start in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 1 and 2 and 3, but specifically 1st and 3rd. The apostle says, Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Haven't I seen our Lord Jesus? Aren't you my workmanship in the Lord? This is my defense to those who would examine me. So there's um, an idea that, well, he is an apostle. He is working of his own free will. He's, he's not a servant who has been forced to do this by his master on earth. Uh, he is an apostle of the Lord. He's seen Jesus. And in fact, he did work there at Corinth. They, you might recall from the book of the Acts, obeyed the gospel when he came to teach. They had learned from John the Baptist, if you will, by means of Apollos. But Apollos had gone through there before he also knew the fullness of the gospel and obedience to Christ Jesus, which Paul taught them and they started. So, so yes, they are his workmanship. This is my defense to those who would examine me. And defense here is um, not a very common word in the New Testament, but it's the it's what you use or what you say in a court of law when you are accused. Uh, if you're into the classics, you may be familiar with uh, Socrates or Plato's Apology, which is a record of Socrates uh, giving his def defense in court. The apology is the word that is translated defense. And it doesn't mean you're sorry. It means here's my answer. Here are the, here's my defense. But he's being examined. So somebody apparently has got a problem with Paul's support mechanism, and that's where he's answering it. My defense to those who would examine me. So first, let's define some terms. He said, I'm free, and I want to talk about free because I think actually this is the larger controlling thought for the entire chapter. Um, so let's talk about free first, uh, and then we can look at some at examinations. But when it comes to the word free here, uh, we do mean free person as opposed to a slave, you know, somebody who is able to choose to do this work. Right, 1 Corinthians 7, verses 21 and 22 lay this out. Were you a bondservant when you were called? Well, don't be concerned about it. But if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself of that opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freedman of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when he was called is a bondservant of Christ. And the bondservant is the person who chooses to serve, right? presents himself as a slave, you know, chooses to be subject to that master of working, but, and gets benefit in exchange for that. And as Paul said, well, you know, if you are currently in service, if you're in that you know, condition of being a slave, don't be concerned about it, but if you can get your freedom, we'll do it. Meaning if you can buy it or if you can work your way out, if there's some way to become free, then do so. But if you can't get out of that, well, you know that you are a freedman in the Lord. Your spirit is free. Uh, you know, God sees you as an equal citizen in the kingdom. But it's also the case that the person who was free when they were called is now the bondservant of Christ. Meaning those of us who, who are free, as our nation is entirely free, who obey the gospel are bondservants to Jesus, meaning we, we have chosen to bring ourselves into subjection to that master to serve him so that we don't just get to do whatever we're free to do. We are to be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So we have this idea also in 1 Corinthians 9, where Paul visits the idea saying, though I'm free from all, I've made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But basically, he believes in free will and he exercises that will to accomplish God's purposes. 
which we're all capable of. Now, when it comes to those who examine me, what we mean by examine here is a judgment. 1 Corinthians 2 uh, explains this pretty well, I think, verses 14 and 15. The natural person doesn't accept the things of the Spirit of God. They're folly to him, and he's not able to understand them because they're spiritually judged or discerned, but it's the same word. The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself judged by no one. So a natural person does not understand the things of God because the judgment has to be spiritual in nature. If your thinking is natural, you don't understand what God's saying. You have to be spiritual in mind to judge that rightly. A spiritual person judges everything, but is himself judged by no one. It's just saying the, the person who is spiritual is exercising judgment all the time in their life, which is consistent with Hebrews 5, right? That they have their senses trained to discern good and evil. But he himself is judged by nobody, which is consistent with 1 Corinthians 4, verses 3 and 4, where he said, with me it's a small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It's the Lord who judges me. But this is an interesting thing to say. It, he said, it, with me, it's a very small thing that I be judged by you or any human court. <laughs> it's just not important. What human courts decide is just not important <laughs> compared to what God has judged, what God has decided. And if, if a human court decides that what we're doing is wrong, that doesn't make it wrong. Be right with God. That's what matters. And he said, whether it's by a human, by you, or by any human court, it just doesn't matter. We are not the standard. I don't even judge myself, he said. <laughs> Which doesn't mean that he isn't willing to examine himself. It just means, you know, I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. Just because you don't realize that something is wrong doesn't mean nothing's wrong. <laughs> you have to be willing and open to hear what God judges so that you can examine yourself in the mirror that is the perfect law of liberty in James 1. All right, so when we speak of judging and examining here, this is what we mean. You're using, you're supposed to be using spiritual judgment. And he said, there are people who would examine me regarding, you know, what I'm doing. What am I doing and how am I being paid? It's really what this is about. So that's where he begins to ask these questions in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 4 through 6. And these are questions that are worth asking. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife, as do the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Well, these are rational questions. Do the apostles have the right to eat and drink? Barnabas and I, that's Paul. Barnabas and I, they don't have wives as far as we can tell. So he said, is it because we don't have the right to, to bring them along? The way the other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas do? Well, no, that's not right, is it? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Refrain from working could mean more than one thing, but basically that, you know, don't they have the ability to live on their support? Could it mean, can they get some vacation time? Maybe. Could it mean, can they retire? Maybe. But I think that the idea is more along the lines of, can we stop building tents and just do the work of the Lord? Are they allowed to do that or not? You know, the apostles are doing that. The brothers of the Lord is doing that, are doing that. Cephas is doing that. Are, are, is the other, are Paul and Barnabas not allowed to do that as evangelists, if you will? So when he says the word right, I don't like to use the word right, but it is actually what it says. Um, and it's important to note a few other things about it. So when we speak of our rights, you know, I don't like to use that word, and I like to temper it appropriately 
as the Bible does, 1 Corinthians 8, verse 9, take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. Now, 1 Corinthians 8, uh, we are speaking about your right to eat meat, regardless of the source of that meat. If they this meat was made during some ceremony where they sacrificed the animal to a false god or an idol, doesn't matter. The meat is unchanged. It's just meat. Unimportant. You're free. You can eat that meat. That's fine. But take care that this right of yours doesn't somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. And by this, he means there might be somebody who knows it was sacrificed and wants to know what you think about sacrifice to that idol. Now you need to be concerned about what are we going to say to this person and what's the impact on this other person? Not that the meat is somehow changed or that the idol has any power or means anything. No. But what about this person who's you know, whose thinking I care about, whose soul I would like to help guide into the gospel, right? So that's where it's possible that this right could become a stumbling block to the weak. That would be bad. You don't want that. And when it comes to the weak, we have comments in exactly this vein. In Acts 20, uh, verses 34 and 35, Paul uses this terminology with regard to support. When he tells the elders at Ephesus, you yourselves know these hands ministered to my necessities and to those who were with me. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it's more blessed to give than to receive. So in in Paul's gospel, him working hard by uh, preaching and holding secular work at the same time to support those who were with him. Though it may not be his wife and children, it's his travel companions who are working with him in the gospel. He supported that. This is what he called working hard to support the weak. Help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus. And when I put that together with what he said in 1 Corinthians 8, be careful lest this right of yours become a stumbling block for the weak somehow. It makes you realize you've got to be very careful about this. That's why I'm worried about the word right, although it's right. That's what it says. But I'm worried about it. I'm thinking about that very carefully. By working hard, we must help the weak. And the Lord said it's more blessed to give than to receive. Okay, well, that's good. The other thing about weakness is back in 1 Corinthians 9, 22, where Paul said to the weak, I became weak that I might win the weak. I become all things to all people that by all means I might save some. So whatever it takes, he's trying to get the gospel out there, however he can do it, whatever is necessary, he'll become that. Now, when we get back to the word right, this occurs also in the ninth chapter at verse 12. If others share this rightful claim on you, don't we even more? meaning people who collect taxes, for example. (laughs) Nevertheless, we haven't made use of this right. We'll talk about that later. Also in the 18th verse, what is my reward that in preaching, in my preaching, I present the gospel free of charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. This man, Paul, is preaching in Corinth free of charge. So when he is working there, they are not paying him for the work that he is doing. And he does this so as not to make full use of his right in the gospel, meaning he has a right in the gospel to be compensated for the work. They should be paying him theoretically at Corinth. And that's a different matter that we'll talk about. He chooses not to accept it from them for other reasons. And 2 Thessalonians, the same thing is true because Corinth, like Thessalonica, is in the regions of Achaia, meaning the Greek-speaking city-states. This is where Paul chose not to accept any money. So in 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 8 and 9, he wrote to them, with toil and labor, we worked night and day. With toil and labor, we worked night and day. That's two things, meaning He did his secular work, and he did the work of the Lord. 
that we might not be a burden to any of you. It was not because we don't have that right. So he wrote to them the same thing. We chose not to take money from the churches in Thessalonica. Not because we don't have the right to do so. That's the thing. He says to them, we did this when we were establishing the truth there, but that's not really what's right. That's not how it should be. Now, when it comes to who do they take along, he said, I, don't we have a right to take along a believing wife? Which, by the way, is a, a bad translation. It should say a sister, a wife. Because that's what the Greek says. And the reason that's important is because it's a direct quote from the Song of Solomon. Uh, which people are always trying to tell us never gets quoted, quoted in the New Testament. Well, that's not true. It is definitely being quoted right there. So it's a sister, a wife. Doesn't he have the right to be married and to enjoy being married? Is really what that means. Because that's what Song of Solomon means. So it's pretty important. Now then, when it comes to taking along, there's this other idea in Matthew 9, and I would like to talk about this. It's, it's related. It's not exactly the same usage, but it is related, and you can see how in Matthew 9, 35 to 38. When he says, take along a believing wife or take along a sister or wife, it's the same word as this, Jesus went throughout all cities and villages. Now, what does that mean then? If we're going to take her along and she's in the going along in the same sense that Jesus went throughout cities and villages. What does it mean? Well, we're talking about she can travel with him. She is supported with him. They, they have what they need to have a family, to have a home. And proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing diseases and afflictions. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said then to his disciples the following, which is very important. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Okay, I think that everybody kind of understands the big idea here that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Meaning that there's just not that many who are willing to teach the gospel. There's not that many that are faithful teachers. That is true. But in particular, what it says is he traveled through all of these regions and was teaching there. And it's the same word that's used in 1 Corinthians 9 for taking the wife along with you. Now the request to the Lord is, you know, the harvest is plentiful, the laborers are few. The request is send laborers into the harvest. What does it mean to send them? Right? It means support them. How can they, how can they go? Who can go work in the field without being paid for the work that they're doing in the field? It doesn't mean, Lord, find somebody who's willing to go, you know, pull crops in for us so we can all eat. It means... Support somebody to do the work to get out there and, and, and pull the harvest, right? Isn't that clearly what it means? The laborers are few. So there has to be enough room that they can live the way that other people live. That's all. Take along. Is this idea that they can travel with them. They can go and be dedicated to doing that work. This is, this is what the gospel calls a right of those that are the teachers of the gospel. Um, I understand that Paul exempted himself in the city-states of Achaia. We'll talk about that at another opportunity. But as a rule, that's not so. As a rule, they are to be supported. And even there in Achaia, you can see Paul writing to them, explaining why he didn't accept support, because it's, it's the norm. That was unusual that he did not do so. And then 1 Corinthians 9, verse 7. 
continues the, re the reasoning in this way. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Or who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? This is all true. <laughs> Nobody goes to war at their own expense. We pay the soldiers. We feed them. We clothe them. We provide their medical care. Even after they get out of the service, we do things for them. Probably not enough, frankly. Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? It's true. You think that you own a vineyard and you don't have any grapes? No grapes? No grape juice at your house? No, that's not how it goes. Who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? Right, you have, you have cattle, you have sheep, but no milk at home, no beef, no mutton. Yeah, no, that doesn't happen. People don't do that. In, in fact, they, they, t they tend to eat the best of it, don't they? I chuckle a little as I remember the great Gary Larson and the far side. <laughs> There's a, a picture of a, of a woman hunkered down in the kitchen and said, late in the evening when everybody was gone, Mary drew the blinds and had a little lamb. <laughs> ah, Gary Larson. But no, truly, uh, who does this, right? Is there any endeavor in life where, you know, you make this effort to bring something about, to accomplish some goal or to bring a crop, but you never partake of anything that's in it? You don't benefit from it personally in any way. No, people don't do that. What company, you know, what company lays off the CEO instead of people on the line? Right? That doesn't happen. What does expense mean? Well, it's a, it's a burden is what it is. It's an expense, but it's a burden. It's a price that you pay. And in 2 Corinthians 11, he reveals to this church in verse 8, I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. As expense, that's the same word as expense. Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? It's this word. I accepted expense from other churches. I robbed those churches to serve you. Because this church didn't pay. That's what he's doing. So understand that that's the meaning is we're talking about support there. We're talking about financial expenditure. And as he says, I robbed other churches. I remember reading the very first time I read that, I was shocked to hear him say that. I thought, surely the apostle didn't commit robbery. It took me a little while to understand what he was saying. That, oh, right, these other churches were sending Paul to teach here. And here should have been supporting him in the first place. Yeah, that's what he's getting at. So just so that they understood that that was the real pattern of God and what should have been. We continue in 1 Corinthians 9, verses 8 through 10. Do I say these things on human authority? Good question. What is he saying? I mean, is this just so that he can turn a profit? Is, is he setting up a great pyramid scheme here? <laughs> uh, a Ponzi scheme, you know, where you take from the other churches until there's no other churches to take from, and then it goes bust. Uh, no. Doesn't the law say the same? It's written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for oxen that God is concerned? Well, there is some truth that, that God is concerned about oxen, some. Uh, the righteous cares for the life of his animal, says the proverb. And that's true. But really, what is this about? Doesn't he certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake because the plowman should plow in hope and the thresher should thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. What does it mean to muzzle an ox while it treads the grain? Well, we're saying you've got the ox doing the heavy work of turning this huge you know, grind, this huge mill. It's treading the grain. But you muzzled him so that he doesn't eat any of it. 
So there's this wonderful, uh, you know, aroma of the fresh cracked grain, you know, this, all of this work that he is doing. And he's doing all the hard work of, uh, of uh, moving that weight, but he's not allowed to eat any of it. Like, it, there's enough there for everybody, and he doesn't eat that much. Like, how stingy are we going to be? We're going to keep him from eating, you know, while he's doing the work of actually producing it. Right? He, the Lord tells them this, not so much because he cares about oxen, although he does care about them, but because he wants us to understand that that's cruel. You don't do that. Doesn't he speak for our sake? The plowman should plow in hope. The thresher should thresh in hope. There should be a share in the crop. The good that comes from it should be shared. But let's talk a little bit more about muzzling the ox. And yeah, I yeah, you know, maybe too a little too willing to say our, that our preacher is like an ox. Well, maybe so. <laughs> First Timothy five might be dumb like an ox. I don't know. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, verse, verses 3 and 4, and verse 8, we talk about widows. And the reason for coming here is because they're linked with the other thing that's in this chapter, but honoring. We're bringing a bunch of things to the fore here, but we're talking about muzzling the ox. The ox is doing the work. Do we let the ox benefit from the work that it's doing? That's what it means. Widows. Well, what work are they doing? Well, um, they have brought up children. They, they have married. They have brought up children. They have done good in the Lord. It says, honor widows who are truly widows. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, let them make some return to their parents. This is pleasing in the sight of God. I understand it says more than that about show some piety, learn how to give back. Yes, but the main idea is let the children or grandchildren learn. Let them make some return to their parents. Isn't that the same thing as sharing in the crop? She's done the work of raising her children. The children have become productive members of society. She now is a widow. Shouldn't her children support her in her old age? Yes, they should. Let them make a return. She should be able to partake of that crop. Shouldn't she? But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, especially members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So we Christians are required to support our parents, our relatives. We're required to do this. But consider honor. It says honor widows. What does it mean to honor them? Well, he's talking about enrolling them. Well, what does it mean to enroll them? It's clear that we're going back to, to Acts chapter 6, where there's a daily distribution for the widows. There are some whose care has fallen to the church because they don't have family left. They're truly alone and dependent on God, and the church supports them on a regular basis. They are enrolled. The deacons are overseeing this work. In Mark 7, verses 9 to 13, we have reference to the principles that provide for this. He said to them, Jesus said, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. Moses said, honor your father and your mother. That's clear. And whoever reviles father or mother will be, or will be put to death, must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or mother, whatever you would have gained from me is korban. That is to say, given to God, quote unquote, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you've handed down. Many such things you do. But again, the, the law says, honor your father and mother. That's what you're supposed to do. That means support them in their old age. But you say, you can tell them whatever you would have gained from me is korban, meaning it has been given to God. You see what they would have gained from him, meaning support, financial support. That's what it means to honor mother and father. 
care for them in their old age. He's saying to them, well, I would, but I've actually given it to God. I've, I've put it into the temple treasury instead of serving you, which is interesting and ironic that you would say you've given it to God when you put it into the temple instead of doing what God said to do in honoring mother and father. <laughs> Their lips, you know, the lips love him, but the heart is far away. So that's what they have done that's muzzling the ox. They're preventing father and mother from being supported by their kids with this error, this false doctrine they teach. That's what is meant by honor. And in 1 Timothy 5, 17 and 18, let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. Well, we've been talking about you shall not muzzle an ox, and it's clear in 1 Corinthians 9 that we are talking about financial support for the preacher. 1 Timothy 5 talks about financial support for the widows, and now we see financial support for the elders. Let the elders who rule well be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. It's saying that they supported their elders too. The elders were doing an important enough work that the congregation supported them to focus on the spiritual work of the church and to be able to leave their secular work and do the spiritual work of the church. And he says they should be worthy of double honor if they labor in preaching and teaching, meaning the, the preacher is worthy of honor, the elder is worthy of honor, and if he does both, he should get both. What Paul says, it's fairly plain that that's what he's talking about. And again, when you put it together with the 18th verse, the scripture says, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. That's clearly a reference to what he said earlier in 1 Corinthians 9. It's clearly about their financial support. They're doing the work. They deserve to get some benefit from it. And the laborer deserves his wages, which is another interesting thing for him to call scripture because it's Luke 10. That's a different lesson for a different time. But very interesting that when Paul can write 1 Timothy, which is where? Somewhere around Acts 19, isn't it? Uh, somewhere in that vicinity, for, right around Acts 19. Um, he already can call Luke's gospel scripture. That's interesting. I thought they said that nobody even knew what scripture was until the Council of Nicene. <laughs> Hogwash. Anyway, Luke 10.1 uh, and five and seven, this is where the idea of the laborer deserves his wages comes from. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. His instructions to them in verse five, whatever house you enter, first say peace be to this house. So he, they try to stay where they, where they go. They don't try to move around from house to house. Seventh verse, remain in that same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. This is the quotation that Paul invokes in 1 Timothy 5. Back here, the elders who rule well should be considered worthy of double honor. The laborer deserves his wages. And Paul says, or I'm sorry, then the Lord had sent them and said, remain in that same house, eating and drinking what they provide for the laborer deserves his wages. We're talking about financial support. It's obvious. They're being supported financially to live, to have their, and obviously elders have to have wives and children. Their children don't have to be so young that they're being supported by dad anymore, but they, they certainly at least have a wife that they're carrying along There's a little bit of, you know, stay there. It, this isn't about trying to uh, move around and merchandise and, and hop from the next, you know, from this one to the next most lucrative thing. 
It's not about that. It's about can you be dedicated to doing the work? Can you be focused on the thing, the business at hand, the spiritual business at hand? That's what they're talking about. But I think it's important to do this, uh, to talk about what the scripture says here, because people, I think, really never uh, have thought about supporting elders in this way. And I don't really know why, because the Bible says this rather plainly. There's no reason not to do it uh, or to consider it. I don't know why the churches aren't doing that. But, you know, uh, a lot of I've heard a lot of people that are against paying preachers at all. So I guess it should be no surprise that paying elders would be out of the question. But it's certainly not out of the scriptures. The Bible doesn't lead you down that path. Uh, well, the other thing about honor is here in Acts um, uh, 28. And I think this is the place that we should stop, actually, instead of moving forward. I think we should stop here. And we'll pick up the idea of the definitions of honor in the next opportunity. But I think we're good with this idea that um, we don't muzzle the ox and the laborer deserves the wages. Um, this is work that they are doing. Elders are doing spiritual work and they are laboring and that labor merits wage. They should get paid for the work that they are doing. And it's enough to support them and their family so that they can live and be among the people the way the people live, wherever that happens to be. And because they're doing an important spiritual work that we all benefit from. That's the idea behind it. So there's um, a lot of things there in the New Testament about it. We'll have to pick up at the next opportunity. But I suppose we say at the beginning, um, we made mention of what Paul had said, am I not free? And it's true. The, uh, you know, the bottom line is that he is choosing to serve and he is choosing to do the work. And... Uh, in the case of Corinth, he chose not to accept their financial support, but it's not really the doctrine. The doctrine is that they should be making their living from the gospel. Uh, those that are laboring in the spirit should be making their living from the gospel, whether that's the uh, preacher or whether that's the elders. The other thing that you read about very plainly is the support of widows in the local congregation who are truly widows. Uh, we don't read about other expenditures, really, in the New Testament. It seems clear that they must have had some. There must have been some things that were necessary. We know uh, sometimes they gave to the needs of the saints in another place, as happened in the uh, days of the famine in the New Testament, but... As a rule, what they typically did was supporting the local work that was being done in the spirit. Caring for their widows, caring for, for their evangelists, caring for their elders. And watching the church grow in faith and in strength because of that. So it's clear, I think, in 1 Corinthians 9 that we are talking about, you know, uh, financial support and enough support to live like everybody else. And that's what the New Testament uh, teaches and brings forth from the law. We saw in the last lesson about the law itself, how they were being given, you know, the food that they needed because they didn't have land. <laughs> so basically, the idea that they didn't have the opportunity to work to provide for themselves meant that they were, in some sense, at the mercy of everybody else to provide for them. Um, he says, even so, does the New Testament teach for those that are working in the word of God, that they also should be able to devote themselves to that work and uh, obtain the, what they need for them and for their families while doing so. That's what the New Testament says about it. We'll pick up some more here in the next uh, opportunity that we come together. But we are talking about these things uh, by request and 
I think they don't get taught plainly enough, mostly because people are embarrassed to talk about them when they themselves are receiving them. <laughs> you know, I'm receiving support from the church here. That's true, but I still have to tell you what the Bible says, whether I'm embarrassed or not. <laughs> Here's what the Bible says about it. So uh, we need to do that and probably need to do more of it. Like I said, I'm not seeing the support that there should be for elders. And uh, we really don't have enough elders. Well, today, if you're not a Christian and not a child of God, let us help you to obey the gospel, uh, to put that support towards the, uh, the, the good thing, the work of God um, in this and other places. If today we could help you to obey the gospel, we have uh, here water prepared. Oh, that's interesting. Looks like I turned on subtitles. Sorry. We have here water prepared that you might be baptized in his name. We have here uh, garments prepared that you might use other than your own. We have lots of things that we've tried to do to make it as easy as possible to obey the gospel. By all means, call if at some point you realize you need to be baptized and you need help from somebody here. Today, if you're a Christian and have not lived right, repent. Make things right with God. Let us help you with our prayers on your behalf. Understand that we join you in, in those prayers asking for God's mercy because none of us has reached sinless perfection either. If today you need our prayers or need to be baptized, let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing.